Need another one of these from that we're going through the study sheets? Anybody? Yeah, there's a couple back through there. All right. Just raise your hand high, throw, throw song books, do whatever you got to do. All right, so today we're starting in Isaiah chapter number 40. In Isaiah chapter number 40 and verse number 3. We're down in, in number 13 if you're following along. So we finished up the first section uh, the last week, week before I went away. Um, we finished up the first section, which dealt with the birth of Jesus. Uh, how many of y'all were here for that? All right, good. So y- you know already how at this juncture, just going through the birth of Jesus, how important it is that we can say, how confidently we can say that we know that Jesus is the Christ, right? He's the Messiah. He fits the bill, and up to this point, He's the only one that fits the bill historically ever of all time for those first 12 points that we have mentioned already. Now we're going to look at verse 13, or not verse 13, number 13 down through number 17, and we're talking about the second part, which is the forerunner. Now why is this important? If you understand the forerunner, it is, the, it is about John the Baptist. How many of y'all know John the Baptist is the forerunner? Right, we're going to establish that tonight. But this is so important because the Lord, as He is prophesied to come, it is prophesied that there would be one who comes before Him who is going to pave the way for Him to come for His ministry. Now, I want you to know this. The Antichrist is going to have a forerunner too. And the forerunner for the Antichrist is the false prophet. And the false prophet is going to point towards the Antichrist as the Antichrist points towards Satan. And he's not going to point towards Satan in the way that we know Satan. He's going to point towards Satan as though Satan is God. And the Antichrist is going to going to point to, to Satan as though he is the, the Savior, or the, as though he is the God of the world, and then the false prophet will point to the Antichrist as though the Antichrist is the fulfillment of the Savior. Now remember this, when the Antichrist comes to power, he's going to be the fulfillment bodily of the Savior figure of every major religion in the world. Remember we talked about that in the first week? So this is why this is so important. The same scriptures that I'm going to use tonight to show you the forerunner of Jesus are going to be the same scriptures that the false prophet will use to say, see, the, he is pointing to the Antichrist as Jesus, as the Mahdi, as uh, all the figures combined together. And so it's so important for us to understand I want you to grasp this, this truth, and, and, and please, please grasp this. Every major religion has two things in common. They have a savior figure in common, and they all have either a forerunner or forerunners. Those people who are coming on the scene in what they call their, their idea of the last days to bring a unity Together, How many of y'all hear so much about unity today? Everything's about unity, 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 ad nauseum. Uh, you and I need to realize that we ought to be in unity, but we're to be in unity over the Scripture. We're not to be in unity over religion. And religion divides. By the way, Jesus is a divider, is He not? And the Antichrist and Satan are going to be the unifier. All of this ecumenism and unity, and let's all get under the same umbrella, it is a ploy and a plot from Satan. It's a very worldly mindset because what it does is it promotes self. We need to be together so that we feel good about things and feel good about each other and feel good about our religion and just feel positive. And folks, when we come to Jesus in the Bible, we don't always feel real good and we don't always feel real positive. As a matter of fact, there is a vast difference between the message of the Antichrist and the message of Jesus Christ. There is a vast difference between the message of the forerunner and the messengers of the the forerunners coming for the Antichrist. Today, let me tell you this, there are already forerunners of the Antichrist. 
just as there always were types of the forerunner of Jesus Christ. Every prophet was a type of a forerunner, but only John the Baptist fit the mold. Everybody got that? All right, so you'll see that tonight. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 3 and 4. It would probably help if I was in the right chapter, wouldn't it? <laughs> Isaiah 40, verse 3 and verse number 4. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, here's the message, and this is very important. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The word Lord there has the, has the same connotation, Old Testament and New Testament, as the Supreme One. The Lord is Jesus Christ, Jesus the Christ, the Lord, the Messiah. He is King of kings and Lord of all lords. Make straight in the desert a highway for our, what's that next word? All right, here's a great difference between the forerunner of the Antichrist and the forerunner of Jesus Christ. The forerunner will not tell the world that the Antichrist is God. They, he will tell the world that the Antichrist is the embodiment of godliness. There's a difference. Everybody hearing that difference? And so what's going to take place is to the Muslim, he will be their Mahdi. To, to the Hindu, he will be their idea of the Messiah. To the Christian, uh, false Christians, you understand, he will look a lot like Jesus looked or, or what their view of Jesus is. To the, to the Jewish world, that will be the Messiah that they are looking for, which is going to be very political. Uh, everybody got that? And so when Jesus came the first time, he was not political, was he? He didn't come to kick the Romans out. He came to save our soul. And so the world is looking for an antichrist. They're looking for a unifier. They're looking for a man who has the answers to the world's problems. They're looking for a man who will fit the mold, who will bring all the world's religions into unity, will bring the world's problems into correction, and will steer the world towards a oneness. And in that oneness, there will be a one world system, a one world finance, and a one world religion. Everybody got that? When Jesus comes the first time, he did not do that. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us very clearly that Jesus divides us, mother against daughter-in-law, a father against son. We're, he's a great divider. All you have to do is start telling people about Jesus that they need to repent and believe because He is God, as the Bible says He was, and you will find that the world hates you. And you will find that the world hates that message. And they'll call you a bigot and old-fashioned and all of that. Folks, understand, the message of Jesus Christ is a finality message. It is a totalitarian message. Jesus isn't the president that gets voted on, and His way isn't like the Constitution where we change it. He is a totalitarian rule. He is a king, and we must understand that. Everybody got that, right? And so the world hates that. Now, it's funny to me because what the world wants is exactly who Jesus actually is, but they don't see Jesus that way. And so they're going to take the pseudo, the false, instead of the right, the true. Now then, when Jesus comes back the second time, He's going to come back and He's going to rule with a rod of iron. As a matter of fact, if you read in the Old Testament, you're going to find some interesting things. Uh, and I just, I, I, I was watching a video this morning when I was eating breakfast and it reminded me of this. During the millennial reign, nobody dies. During the millennial reign... Jesus rules with a rod of iron. During the millennial reign, um, there's going to be totalitarian rule. Jesus is the king of the earth, you see. And for a thousand years, we're going to rule with Christ. And then the devil's going to be let loose for a little season. People ask me all the time, why, Pastor Paul, will the devil be let loose for a little season? I'm not God, I don't know. But I know it's just for a short while, and then that old devil's going to be destroyed and cast into a lake of fire. Amen. And then we have a new earth, folks, because this one's going to be burned up. And the sin curse is going to be done. Aren't you glad of that? So before I go any further with the forerunners, understand who the forerunner is now for the second coming of Jesus. It's us. 
We now are the forerunners of the second coming. John the Baptist, and I'll get to the scripture real quick here in a minute and show you. But John the Baptist as the forerunner was telling people, he was pointing people to Jesus. Remember what he said? I'm not worthy to even untie and tie his shoes. And yet the Lord said there was none greater born of a woman than John the Baptist. And he baptized Jesus. Jesus was baptized in obedience. Everybody got that, right? So as he was pointing everybody to Jesus, you and I, that's what our job is right now. We are living in that parenthesis between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel. We are living in the age, the dispensation of grace. And as we are in that age and dispensation of grace, we have one message. The message is to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. Prepare yourself because the king is coming. Am I right? And so John the Baptist, being a few months older than Jesus, when he was born, remember, he he leaped in his mother's womb, didn't he? And so his whole life was a life to point people, be ready, the Messiah's here, the Messiah's here, the Messiah's here, get ready. And when Jesus showed up, here he is, here he is, follow him. Don't follow me anymore, follow him, you see. And that's exactly what our message is to be today. Our message is not follow me, our message is follow him. Our message is don't be like me, it's be like him. Our message is Jesus is coming again. Be prepared. Be ready. Am I right? Everybody with me so far, okay? So understand how important this is. It is so vitally important that we understand John the Baptist, his ministry, his foretelling, and how that fit in prophecy, and how you and I today are to be telling the people the same thing that John was. Hey, Jesus is coming. He's right there, and he's coming. It's right on the horizon. I don't know when Jesus is coming, and you don't either. It could be before I'm done talking, and even so come Lord Jesus. But we've got to constantly be ready, and we've got to be warning people. This is the mission of the church, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? What is the gospel? The death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus for salvation so that you are ready to meet Him either through death or when He comes. Amen. So let's keep going. So he said this, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So, does everybody see how John the Baptist took care of verse number 3 expressly? And do you understand how we fit into verse 4 and 5? Because when Jesus came the first time, did He flatten the mountains? I'm asking a good question. Did He walk through the eastern gate? No, He rode on a donkey through the eastern gate, didn't He? But the Bible tells us that the second time Jesus comes, He steps foot on the Mount of Olives and He makes the mountains flat and the valleys rise. And He is going to walk through that eastern gate, which today is all blocked up. The Muslims blocked it up so that nobody could come through it, so they couldn't say they were the Messiah. But when that earthquake happens, it's going to be a supernatural event. And the mountain shall come. It's going to be a flat walk right across. And the rocks, the stones, they tried to keep Jesus out. It ain't going to happen. And he's coming through that eastern gate as the king. Hallelujah. Now go over to the New Testament. Look over in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 3. Let me show you this. Luke, chapter number 3, and verse 3 through 6. This is speaking of John the Baptist here. Luke, chapter 3, verse 3. And he came into the country uh, about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Notice this. The baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Water baptism was never what took any sins away. Repentance is what takes sins away. You get that? And so when the Bible talks about, and we've all heard the Church of Christ crowd say, the Bible says that um, 
we, we have to be uh, washed in water. We have to be baptized in the water for salvation, right? Uh, for remission of sins. Well, understand this. You don't go into the baptistry to have your sins removed. The word for is the key. And I've told you all this before, I'm sure. But you don't take a, an aspirin for a headache to get one. You take it because you already had one. And it's because you had that predetermined condition that you take the aspirin. Am I right? So the same way as it is in that verse, we're washed, we're baptized in the water for the, uh, for the remission of sins. We are baptized in water for, and the word for is the key in the context, the old English sense, because of our salvation. It's an outward sign of what God's already done on the inside. Baptism is a very important thing in a believer. And every believer should be baptized. But it is an outward sign of agreement. It's a step of faith. It's a step in your journey, in your walk with Christ. Everybody got that, right? So the water, it would, it's really foolish, isn't it? To think that something that is sin-cursed can wash away your sins. When the blood of Jesus is the only thing that can wash away your sins, and it's not sin-cursed because it's God's blood, not human blood. Amazing, right? So notice this, uh, and it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. There it is. This shows that John the Baptist is the one who is the forerunner that was prophesied in the book of Isaiah. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. That will happen, and it's going to happen in the future. And the crooked shall be made straight. Guess what? The crooked will be made straight. That also will happen. There's going to be a restoration of this world in the millennial reign. But guess what? I was crooked once and the Lord made me straight too. How about you? Yes, indeed. And the rough ways shall be made smooth. By the way, that also will happen in the millennial reign. The rough ways. What are the rough ways? Think about what's going to take place in the tribulation period. Think about what's happening right now. Doesn't the Bible say in the last days that evil will be on the increase, lawlessness will be on the increase? It's going to be perilous times. Men will be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. All that stuff that Timothy and Paul talked about, right? Understand this. When the Lord Jesus steps foot on this earth, He's not going to put up with that foolishness. He's going to rule with the rod of iron. And there's a restoration that takes place but it will be a forced restoration in some parts. This is not the Jesus that people want to talk about today. The Jesus people want today is some lovey-dovey, squishy, mamby-pamby, effeminate Jesus. And that's not Jesus. He's the King of hosts. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. When He comes back, He's coming back and on His thighs written a name that nobody knows but Him. Out of His mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword and He's going to slaughter His enemies. The Bible says that they're going to pop like grapes pop. And He's going to tread the winepress of the wrath of God and the blood of His enemies are going to flow to the horse's bridle. That is not a mamby-pamby, effeminate, sissified Jesus. That's a warrior. That's a mighty king and a mighty God. Amen? And he has the right to do it. He made us. He's got the right to destroy us. Everybody got that? What, what a Savior. And so he's going to make all that rough stuff smooth, but it's not going to always be easy. Think about this. Any of y'all ever work with wood? All right, so you go out and you get rough sawn wood, right? And you want to make it smooth. What do you got to do to it? You got to plane it and sand it? All right, so what is that doing? That's ripping the rough edges off of that board, right? You think that board, if that board was alive, would want that to happen to it? Absolutely not. Just like you and I, we're rough when we get saved, aren't we? Some of us rougher than others. But we were rough when we got saved. And when the Lord brings smoothness to us, it's chunks taken off of us. It hurts sometimes, doesn't it? When we're corrected by the Lord and smoothed by the Lord. But you know what? The Bible tells us that one day when we stand before God, all of our works are going to be judged. It's either wood, hay, and stubble, which will be burned up, or it's gold, gems, and precious stones. And as the fire of the Lord is applied to it, it will be purified and made brighter and better and smoother and worth more value. And that's what the Lord is starting to do on you and I right now. I don't like to be corrected. I don't like to be chastened any more than you do. It hurts sometimes. But as the Lord does it, 
He's making us what we ought to be. And what are we supposed to be? People who are telling the world that they need to be ready when the Messiah comes. They need to be saved because they could die at any moment. They need to be saved because the Lord could come back at any moment, right? And hell is the only other alternative. Notice this, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. That's a fact. All flesh will see the salvation. What is the salvation of God? Jesus. So when John the Baptist was prophesying and pointing the way towards Jesus, when you and I are telling people uh, about the coming of Jesus, that is, that's what we prophesy in the New Testament, is the coming of Christ. He's coming. Whenever you tell somebody Jesus is coming again, you're, you're prophesying. But it's not weird or strange, is it? It's already written in the Word of God. That's all we prophesy is what's already written. Everybody got that? And so when we're doing that, why are we doing that? Because the salvation of God, every man is going to see Him. One day you and I are going to see Jesus. We are going to see Him, and if you're saved, we're going to see Him as our Savior, our glorious God, our glorious King, our Savior, our Lord, our Master, the one that we truly love. But this lost and dying world is going to see Him as judge, final judge, and they'll hear the words, depart from me, cursed into everlasting. I never knew you. You're a worker of iniquity, a worker of lawlessness. You and I don't want that for people. And so when we're out there and we're given that message, understand we're doing that job like that planer. We're trying to cut to the core. We're trying to show them the truth. We're, and it hurts them. And they rebel against that. They kick back against that. And it hurts them sometimes. And sometimes our family and our friends... It hurts them when we tell them the gospel. They get angry, don't they? They get agitated and irritated. Well, guess what? Don't ever stop. It is your job to tell them the truth. And every time you tell them the truth, you are doing exactly what John the Baptist was telling the world. Everybody's going to stand before Jesus. All those people that say, I don't believe in Jesus. I, you, whatever, preacher, I don't even believe in it. I'm sorry you don't believe in it because one second after you die, you will wish you had listened to me. You will wish you had paid attention. Am I right? So we've got to understand. Everybody good with that so far? Back to Malachi. That's the book right before the New Testament, the last book of the Bible. Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi 3. Behold, I will send my messenger. The word messenger there has the context of a, not just one who gives a message, but a crier. Now, we don't have that anymore in our, in our culture because of technology, but it used to be up until the time of radio and especially television that if there was any news uh, of great significance, most of the towns would have a bell, either a, a large metal ring or a metal bell or a church bell, and they would ring the bell and the people would gather and they would gather because either somebody's house is on fire and they need to take care of that. Uh, they're about to be attacked by some rogue band of Indians or what have you. Or there was some great news that, the, that everybody in the community needed to know. So the bells would ring, the people would gather, and there would be a crier, somebody who had a loud, obnoxious voice. And they would read the message from the mayor, the governor, the president, the king, whoever. They were called the town crier. How many of y'all have ever heard of them? They were very prevalent everywhere in the world until technology took their place. And so they would cry out. And that's what this is. One who's crying out in the wilderness. Uh, that was John the Baptist, wasn't he? He was the messenger in the sense of a town crier. Only nobody in Jerusalem, nobody in the towns where the Jews had the prominent position, they didn't want to hear his message. They would run him out of the town, just like they did the Apostle Paul. And so that's why when he talks about one crying in the wilderness, you and I are crying in the wilderness today as well. They don't want us in government to tell them about Jesus, do they? Anybody see what they did to old Jack Hibbs? I mean, they tried to crucify the poor man. They asked him to come to, to Congress and open up Congress with prayer. And he opened up Congress in prayer this way. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the only Savior of humanity, something like that. 
And they tried to crucify him because he broke all the rules in his opening statement because you can't say anything about Jesus, you can't say anything about Heavenly Father, you can't say anything about salvation, you can't, you can't. And he hit it all. Hit it all in one sentence, folks. And he'll never be asked again. I guarantee. They're not going to ask me to ever pray an opening at a football game. You know why? Because this is what they want. Almighty God of the ultimate universe. Thouest, knowest, allest, thingest. <laughs> Beest with us thou tonight in the football game. They don't want nothing real. And we're supposed to be salt and light. And anytime we're given an opportunity, whether it's a prayer to open something or somebody asks you a question about Jesus, we are to be a voice crying in the wilderness just like John the Baptist was because that's where you find yourself. That's the wilderness position you're in at that moment. And it can cost you people. Telling somebody about Jesus can cost you a job. I know I lost, I lost a job over it. But I would lose it again. Lose it again. Jesus and somebody's soul is more important than the almighty dollar. Mm -hmm. Now look, and so he said this, let's go back, 3-1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Notice that me there. This is God speaking. So for the Jews who deny the Trinity, I want you to know the Trinity is all throughout the Old Testament. There are many times where it's me, I, the Lord speaking. That's Jesus. Jesus is Lord. He was the Lord. He's always been the Lord. It differentiates when God the Father speaks. There is a great voice out of heaven. That's the Father. When it says, I spoke, the Lord spoke to me. When the Lord appeared unto, that's Jesus, you see. And He said, He shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to His temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, He shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And Jesus came and they rejected Him, didn't they? Absolutely. Flip over to Matthew chapter number 11. Let me show you the fulfillment of this. Matthew chapter 11. I'm doing better not losing my place, ain't I? Matthew chapter number 11 and verse number 10. This is so important we see this. Um, so Jesus, in chapter number 11, He's talking about John here. Notice what He says, Matthew 11 and verse number 10. For this is He of whom it was written, speaking of John the Baptist, Behold, I send my messenger. Now you find that in Isaiah 40, you find it in Malachi 3. I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Isn't that amazing? You know what he was saying? It's better to be dead and in the kingdom of heaven than to be alive and be John the Baptist. Isn't that amazing? So I want you to know something, folks. We must not value or measure our value on this earth, by others. Measure your value of what you're going to be when you die and go to glory. That's what you need to measure your value. And it's all about the love that you have for Jesus. You know, we're all going to be judged the right way by God. You see, sometimes we get it in our mind that because God calls somebody like John the Baptist to be the forerunner, that they're super Christians and they're, they're judged this way. And because you go, you've got a job and a family to raise and you come to church and you're faithful to church, you're going to be judged way down here. Not, not so. The Lord judges us all by His Word and it's by our faithfulness, by the love that we give to God. And so God, if God calls you to something great, then do something great for His glory. But don't expect a greater reward than somebody He lays it on their heart to give somebody a cold glass of water in His name. That somebody that gave that cold glass of water in His name might get a greater reward than you, who He calls to be the next Billy Graham. Did you know that? It's all about your heart. 
It's all about your surrender. It's all about your love for Jesus and your, ser- and your service. Isn't that amazing? And so understand this. What he's saying is, hey, yeah, John the Baptist, he's the greatest born. He's the greatest one alive, but let me tell you who's greater. Anybody that's already dead and gone on into glory, they're all greater. We must remember that. Amen? You're still with me, right? All right. So we're going to skip number 15 because that deals with something else. We're going to verse uh, number 16 back in Deuteronomy number 18. Deuteronomy 18. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Here we go. So in chapter number 18 of Deuteronomy and look in verse number 15. I believe I got the right verse here. Yep. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee. Notice that's a capital P. It's important that you understand because some people try to say this is Jesus himself. It's not. Um, It is the prophet. It is the forerunner. The reason it's capitalized in your Bible is because there is a differentiation between John the Baptist and all the other people of the day who were being baptized of John who were also saying to other people, prepare because the Messiah is coming. Think about it this way. Just like right now, if God were to raise up John the Baptist, if we were living in that day, wouldn't all of us who are saved be, tell, be telling everybody, get ready, the Lord's coming. Wouldn't we be telling the same message? But he yet is the prophet, the forerunner. Make sense? Okay. And so that's the context of that. So the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren. Like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. So that very verse differentiates the fact that it's not Jesus, It is someone else. And to his voice, you shall hearken. Now, I want you to hear me. Hear me well. We have the same message that we've been preaching since 33 AD. That Jesus Christ died on the cross. He was buried and rose again the third day. And he can come at any time. You need to be saved. You need to get ready. Same message. Am I right? For all those years, people have been trusting Christ. Are you saved? You are saved because somebody told somebody that told somebody that told somebody that told you. And so that's the way we are. We are to keep telling somebody, keep telling somebody, keep telling somebody. But we are not the prophet. We are not a prophet, capital P, prophet. We're not the one that's the be all end all to tell everybody about Jesus. Neither was Billy Graham, y'all. He was just another sinner saved by grace. Okay, everybody got that, right? And so we are just pointing the way to the coming Messiah. The prophet has already come. John the Baptist has already come. And he pointed people toward Jesus. And the people then believed John as the Bible prophesied. They would hearken to his voice. And they believed John. They listened to him. And then they were going out telling their family, telling their friends. And the people, John was bigger than Jesus was. John's following was bigger than Jesus's was until Jesus started doing great miracles. When Jesus started doing great miracles, folks, we, you, you can't imagine, we can't comprehend the vast volumes of people per capita that followed Jesus. But they didn't follow him just for the truth. Many of them followed him because they wanted their bellies filled. Some of them followed him because they wanted their diseases healed. Some of them followed him because they wanted to see miracles. They wanted to see some signs. But there were some that followed for salvation. The same as it was with John the Baptist, the same as it is with us. Not everybody comes to church on Sunday morning saved and on their way to glory. There's a lot of them that come. They're they're following us. They're following along with us, but they're not of us. They're, They're just going through the motion. You get that, right? But one of these days, one of these days, that stuff's all going to be done. It's all going to be over with. You got that? So that was the prophecy. Look over in Acts chapter number three. This is so cool. Acts chapter number three. I hope y'all like this stuff because I, I, I dig this stuff. Acts chapter number three. Look in verse number 20 down through 22. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Now, let me back up just a little bit. In verse number 19, 
he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's salvation. Y'all remember when you got saved? Man, that, you talk about a time of, 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 of just fresh. That was the greatest day ever, wasn't it? Absolutely. So repent ye. Remember this. Repentance is key. What did John the Baptist preach? Repentance. What did Jesus preach? Repent ye. He said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's what Jesus preached. And John said, listen to what Jesus had to say, repent and be baptized. Repent for the remission of sins. Be baptized. Jesus is here. He's coming. You and I, same message, right? Okay, look at this now, verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord uh, your God raise up unto you, that's from Deuteronomy, of your brethren like unto me, him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say uh, unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So, is that or is that not serious? All right, look up here. I want you to see this. You and I have the most serious message in all the world. Why is it that church now, think about this for a minute, why is it now that everybody, not y'all, but for the most part, everybody wants to go to a church that's all about fun, that's all about feel good, that's all about self-promotion, that's all about self-esteem. Why do people want to go to that? They want to go to that. They attach themselves to that because of two major reasons. The number one reason is this. They do not know the truth because the truth has not been presented to them. Or two they are in rebellion to the idea of repentance for salvation. Does everybody get that? In our modern world, this is what everybody wants. This is what, this is what modern church is. And folks, I'm telling you, they're building great big buildings. They want quality entertainment. They want music that's quality. Like we're talking about quality, quality. World class. They want the same music they listen to in their car. They just want to feel like it's Jesus stuff. Want the same music, want the same atmosphere, the same music as the world. And so that's why everything has changed in church. That's why you don't have a lot of red in churches anymore. You don't have a lot of crosses in churches anymore. You don't have crowns of thorns in churches much anymore. That's why people don't sing out of hymn books much anymore. That's why the preacher doesn't open up the Bible and preach from the Bible much anymore. It's all off the wall or just quote a verse and then tell people a story. This is why this is happening, y'all. It is because we are living in the days where the people were like the people in the, the Bible times. Because all times are Bible times. And the people heard the message. They heard John the Baptist crying. He was a voice crying in the wilderness. The religious crowd didn't want to hear him. Why? They were too interested in their religion instead of hearing the truth. And then the other crowd was too interested in their worldly activities than to hear the truth. The people who listened were broken people. The people who listened were people who had no hope who found that the worldly thing left them empty and there was no hope in religion, only, only more sorrow and ridicule, only more con condemnation. There's condemnation in religion. There's freedom in Jesus, you see. And so this is what's taking place. So what people don't want, they don't want to repent. They don't want to admit they're sinful they don't want to acknowledge their sin. They don't want to acknowledge the things that God says they need to acknowledge in order to be saved. Nobody gets saved until they're lost. They get religious, but they don't get saved. 
They either get religious or they get worldly. Am I right or wrong, y'all? Help me out now. I remember when I was a lost man. I was a lost man. I went to church. I took up the offering. I did stuff at church. I helped out here and there. I wasn't real faithful, but I was there some. You understand. The good old boy church guy. Sat in the back pew so I could get out quick. But I was there. You understand. Some of y'all were that way too. Am I right? Yeah. I didn't get saved because I hated the notion that I was a horrible person, even though I was a horrible person. I didn't want to admit I was dirty and filthy and ungodly and wicked and vile. I wanted to look at all them church people, drop F-bombs in front of them, see how they squirmed, and I'd find out some of them would drop an F-bomb right back at you. And then I'd say, see, I'm just as good as they are. Matter of fact, one of the guys I took up the offering with, we would be drunk on Friday or Saturday night. Take up the offering on Sunday morning. It's easy to take up an offering with a hangover. Listen to me, y'all. I did not want to come to that. I wanted to go to the world. The world accepted me any way I was. The lost church accepted me any way I was. But the problem was, mixed in that lost church was true Christians. And true Christians were constantly telling me, repent and believe. You're not good enough to get to heaven. You fall short of the glory of God. You need Jesus and Jesus alone. And that irritated the fire out of me. And then, lo and behold, the Lord got on my trail and I got saved. I got saved. Gloriously saved. And when I got saved, I did a 180 degree turn. I changed, and I wanted to be in church. I stopped dropping the F-bombs in front of church people. Aren't you glad? (laughs) And I stopped doing those kinds of things. All of a sudden, this is what I found. That worldly crowd that accepted me when I went to church but acted like them, they didn't want me anymore. You know why? Because I could not help but tell them. Because I had been released from the world, I was free in Jesus and I wanted them to have the same freedom in Jesus that I had, the love that I had. And when I told them that, they looked at me as though I was condemning them. And then I found that this church over here, these church people that were lost, they didn't want to hear it either. They did not like the 180 degree change. They didn't like it because that brought condemnation to them because all of a sudden now I was one of them old fogies. I can't tell you how many church people I sat with that told me this. You know, salvation is just about doing the best you can. Salvation is just about, you know, you go to church and do the best you can. God, God will just take care of it. That's a wrong answer. And I sat in church like that, and I sat in church with people like that. And when I changed, immediately, the way I worshiped changed. The things I said changed. The things I believed changed. And that crowd distanced themselves from me, just like I used to distance myself from those other people. Y'all get that? Now, I said all that to say this. All those people, whether they're in the world or whether they're in church, that will not heed the message, they'll listen but not repent, they're going to be destroyed. They're going to spend an eternity in hell. That breaks my heart. It ought to break your heart tonight. I mean, it really should. We should not preach on hell without tears, folks. Now, you and I who are saved, we're on our, this is as close to hell as we're ever going to get. We're on our way to heaven. And so we must be the forerunners. Jesus is coming again. And just as it was prophesied, and you can clearly see that John the Baptist was the prophet, the forerunner, we now have a job to do that he taught us to do, that Jesus taught us to do, that the apostles taught us to do, that our forefathers taught us to do, that whoever it was that preached unto you the Lord Jesus, and you repented and believed, taught you to do. And that's to go into the world and tell the world that Jesus is coming. Be the forerunner. Be a forerunner.
even if you can't be the main four runner. There's somebody you can win. There's somebody you can tell. There's somebody you can influence. Amen? You're not, you're, 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 let me put it this way. You're more effective than you think you are. There are some of you sitting here tonight because somebody else sitting here tonight invited you to be here. And there are other people, some of you remember people who used to be here and they invited you to be here and they're no longer here. Right? Just don't be that one who ain't no longer here no more. Be faithful. Stick, stick it out. Stay put. And keep telling people that Jesus is coming. Bring them in. Let me preach the devil out of them. Come on. And, and, and we'll, see people get to, we'll see people get saved. It's not about us. It's not about our name. It's not about our church. It's about Jesus. I would rather see somebody come and trust Christ, go from here, go to another church, plug in and serve there faithfully and be where they're supposed to be for the glory of God than come here and be miserable because they stayed here out of guilt or obligation. Right? Wouldn't you? Yeah, amen. All right, so John the Baptist was a forward. Next week we're going we're gonna to drop down into number 18. Uh, you can read the other one about uh, Messiah would be preceded by Elijah. Uh, that kind of comes more in a little bit. Uh, it, there's a twofold message in that, and we're going to back up to that a little later on. Okay? All right. Would anybody like to close us in prayer tonight? Thank you, brother.